I think most historians would tell you that the purpose of history is to ask questions that matter, to look at the past and see how it helps us to understand the present day, and perhaps to plan for the future. At first glance, the question who was the last pharaoh looks like a question that simply doesn't matter. After all, events happen however we choose to interpret them, and these categories and labels are only useful to historians and nitpickers, right? I don't think so. No, this question doesn't matter in that it won't directly help us solve any present-day political crises. Even so, it speaks to something that is important, how we categorise the past and how those categories reflect our own deeper biases. Because while events did happen regardless of our perception of them, unless you're there to witness them, whether they happened yesterday or 3,000 years ago, all you have is the perception of others. The question of who was the last pharaoh actually calls upon us to answer other questions, whether we know we're answering them or not. What was a pharaoh? What counts as ancient Egypt? What counts as a ruler, even, or a nation, or a state? I'm going to try to test these silent, implied questions and see what they lead to. I might not convince you to come to the same answer as I will, but I hope I can convince you that the question is more interesting and more complex than it first appears. The fact that it's at all debatable who the last pharaoh was, and the fact that, for instance, Wikipedia articles mention at least four people who could be, for various reasons, proves that this is a discussion still worth having. It won't decide anything of consequence to the real lives of any Egyptians today, but the exercise gives us useful tools for looking at any historical era, and be honest, who doesn't love a bit of nitpicking? Just as a quick heads up, this episode will feature a couple of extremely brief mentions of suicide. The events in question are literally ancient history, and I won't be going into any detail. Egyptology is, like all varieties of history, in that the historians have an agenda, be it Manetho creating a guide to help a Hellenic elite fit in as Egypt's rulers, or 19th century historians defending the racist belief that the accomplishments of the Egyptians prove that they were white. The very act of taking an interest in history is the act of giving yourself a stake in it. Couple that with the fact that a great many historians around the world aren't studying present or recent events, and are therefore historiographers, interpreting through the lens of their own biases the histories written by long-dead biased historians, and you can see how even tiny quirks in the recording of a given event can lead to horrendous misconceptions that make their way into the popular consciousness. Nobody needs to be acting dishonestly for this to happen, by the way. Maybe careless in some cases, but deliberate lying isn't necessary for a falsehood to be taken as truth. A quick note on names here. The purpose of armchair Egyptology is to help Egyptology be approached and approachable by anyone who's interested, not in purity. What that means is that despite my personal inclination to try to pronounce names as accurately as possible, I'm going to stick to the spellings, and therefore pronunciations, that you'll find more useful when looking them up in your own time. I will try to pronounce them consistently, but a lot of these names come from Greek sources, and to be honest, the ancient Greeks made a bit of a hash of them. I don't speak Greek, so you're getting the anglicised, Hellenized versions of names in a language whose pronunciation remains more or less obscure. We all say Tutankhamun, even if it was closer to Tuwata Aranachamana, which I think is probably also a million miles off, in part because I don't speak any Afroasiatic languages either. Pharaoh is the word the Greeks used to describe the king of the nation they called Aguptos. The term comes from an Egyptian word I'm going to mispronounce as Parawa, which translates literally as Great House. Earlier on, it was used to refer to the overall mechanism of government, just as today you might hear that the White House issued a statement. In the 18th dynasty, when kingship evolved, as it did many times throughout Egypt's history, the term Great House was applied increasingly to the person of the king, 
and nowadays pharaoh is simply a term that we use to mean a monarch of ancient Egypt, and it applies as much to the earlier pharaohs as the later ones. So no, the kings of the old kingdom likely would not have answered to the title pharaoh any more than they would have liked the implications of the term old kingdom, but it's a useful term for us, just as it helps to say Kaiser or Maharaja or Karan, even when those are just specific words for different cultures' emperors. The idea of the last pharaoh comes down in part on when you think the nation and or culture of ancient Egypt came to an end. I want to explore the ambiguities, and I've come up with three kinds of last pharaoh to qualify for the final round. The first is the last native monarch of Egypt. The specific ceremonial and political elements of pharaohdom were so quintessentially Egyptian that even foreign invaders adopted Egyptian means of governance. The last pharaoh is arguably the last Egyptian monarch of ancient Egypt. By the way, sometimes I'm just going to say Egypt. I never mean the present day country or the intervening iterations, unless I say otherwise. The second is the last ruler of independent Egypt. Egypt, of course, came under the rule of the Roman and then Byzantine empires, and before that was conquered on and off by Persians. Arguably, the last pharaoh was the last person to rule the country while it still had sovereignty. The third, strangely, is the last person to rule Egypt with the title pharaoh. This one seems pretty self-explanatory, but I think leads to some surprising answers. Questions about nativity and nationality are tricky for a few reasons. For one thing, the ancient world didn't necessarily possess the same idea of nationality that has arisen in the modern West, with its international empires and nasty habit of dehumanising foreigners. For another, the debate often reduces to absurdity, particularly when people ask, whether in good faith or bad, what it means for a group to be native to a region. What I mean by native ruler of Egypt is that the rulers in question were born in Egypt of long Egyptian descent. Already, you can tell, this definition is flawed. What do I mean by long Egyptian descent? A few generations? A few centuries? It arguably includes, for instance, Cleopatra VII, who will come up later in the video. I don't include her as a native ruler for these purposes, because her political and cultural presence in Egypt is not an Egyptian one. While the question of how long a group has to live in a place before they're considered native is in itself interesting, it isn't relevant here. Cleopatra was the descendant of foreign invaders and ruled entirely on that basis, however much her family might have assimilated. With all that in mind, there are two candidates for last pharaoh who were each arguably the last native rulers of ancient Egypt, Pasamtek III and Nectanebo II. Pasamtek III didn't reign for long, and his end was a desperately sad one. Then again, in history, very few endings are either spectacular or triumphant. Pasamtek III succeeded his father, Armos II, in the wake of a devastating diplomatic failure. Armos had promised the King of Persia one of his daughters as a wife, but sent someone else instead. Outraged, the Persians began a long march to Egypt with vengeance aforethought. Pasamtek therefore inherited a kingdom under direct foreign threat. He also suffered a public confidence problem. His accession was marred by a dramatic meteorological event. At the ancient royal city of Waset, known to us more commonly as Thebes, not long after Pasamtek's coronation, it rained. Was all I ever wanted. To put that into context, the average annual rainfall in that region today is zero millimetres. This alarmed the public. With a foreign army on the way, this didn't help Pasamtek's confidence. And so Pasamtek, young, inexperienced, and betrayed by his erstwhile allies, was captured by the Persians after a devastating military defeat. Though he would attempt to raise a rebellion against Persian rule, this too would fail. Pasamtek died to suicide a mere six months after becoming pharaoh. This wasn't the first time Egypt had succumbed to foreign invasion, but this was not a takeover by a foreign dynasty, it was an annexation. With Pasamtek's death, Egypt ceased to be an independent kingdom for the first time. 
Pasamtek would not be Egypt's last native ruler, as Persian rule would be successfully overthrown in time, but this last burst of independence would prove to be temporary, leading to the possibility that Pasamtek was the last pharaoh and any others simply pretenders to the title, holding on to the idea of a nation that no longer existed. As soon as I mention that possibility, I'm going to discount it. Nations and statehood are complex things and beyond the scope of this video, but I did say I would test the question of nationhood and statehood. And it seems to me that we need to remember the last native dynasty to rule Egypt lasted for 37 years. Not long as a proportion of ancient Egypt's existence, but longer than you or I have ever ruled a country. The last native ruler, with the same definition of native I've already mentioned, was therefore probably Nectanebo II. He ruled for 18 years of what we now call the 30th dynasty. The Persian Empire fractured in a succession crisis, giving the Egyptians the opportunity to retake control. The reason I'm inclined to count the 30th dynasty as just as legitimate as those that came before is that had history gone another way, we might view Persian rule as a century-long blip in a millennia-long history, just another intermediate period. As we'll see, the return of native rule itself turned out to be the blip. From the Persian point of view, Egypt was rightfully a satrapy of the empire, in need of bringing closer into the fold, and the story of the 30th dynasty is dominated with internal political intrigue and the constant pressure of Persian reconquest. Nectanebo managed to hold Egypt for so long, primarily because the Persian rulership had to spend years consolidating power after some internal struggles. But despite raising a considerable army, and marshalling several foreign allies, he eventually lost Memphis to the Persians. Egyptian political power at the time was concentrated in Memphis, so we needn't imagine Persians sweeping the country in a grand invasion, as Nectanebo himself must have realised as he fled south by taking Memphis the Persians had conquered Egypt, even if those in the south had yet to capitulate. Nectanebo did try to raise an army later on to overthrow Persian rule, but was unsuccessful. He probably lived out his life in Nubia, a king in exile, never to return to his homeland. There is a legend, and we shouldn't believe it for a moment, I don't think, but it's too much fun not to go into. And the legend goes that Nectanebo fled not south into Nubia, but north, ending up in Macedonia, and presented himself to the court of the Macedonian king as an Egyptian mystic. There, he is said to have disguised himself as the god Amun and fathered Alexander the Great. This is a fantastic story, and certainly was a story that Alexander may have believed, or at least a story he may have propagated. It would have been useful to him when he later proclaimed himself pharaoh, but also it would have been useful to the Egyptian priesthood, because when Alexander came to drive the Persians out of Egypt, in a sense this story would have meant he was a native Egyptian in some way. But it's a fairly flimsy fiction. What it's useful for, however, is in telling us that Nectanebo II was regarded by people of his time as Egypt's last native ruler. Alexander the Great used this status of Nectanebo being the last true pharaoh, not counting the Persians, to give himself political weight, to give himself right to rule over Egypt. Nectanebo is a name you might not have heard of unless you're already somewhat familiar with that period of history. He's not widely taken to be the last pharaoh, but I think there are compelling reasons to call him the last king of ancient Egypt. You see, with the Persian conquest, the two kingdoms would never again be both independent and native ruled. If part of your personal definition of pharaoh is that they must be king of ancient Egypt, then Nectanebo is probably your man. Now, for my part, I think ancient and classical are useful distinctions up to a point. It is useful to categorise periods of history and culture, but it doesn't necessarily reflect the feelings of people at the time. They didn't stand around their fields and temples saying, well, 
That's the end of ancient Egypt. Better start the classical era. Egypt would, of course, regain its independence much later and with a foreign aristocracy comprising its ruling class. One member of that foreign aristocracy, above all, is credited by most as the last pharaoh. Alexander the Great was revered in Egypt for liberating it from Persian control, but in taking the title of pharaoh he certainly didn't grant Egypt its own sovereignty. A short Alexandrian dynasty followed his death, though Alexander's brother, and then son, did not truly rule in any meaningful way. In time, clashes between Alexander's many companions resulted in Egypt coming into the hands of a man we shall simply call Ptolemy, though he was the first of fifteen kings to bear that name. When Ptolemy was given the title of pharaoh, it was a ceremonial one. Arguably, his role was really that of satrap, with sovereignty over the Nile Valley actually belonging to the Macedonian crown. By the end of Ptolemy's life, however, he was recognised not as a glorified regional governor, but as the king of an independent territory. His possession of the title of pharaoh transitioned from ceremonial to factual. Under the Ptolemies, a new Hellenic ruling elite took root in Egypt, and the Ptolemaic dynasty itself was the bridge between those two worlds, at least nominally. In truth, Ptolemy and his descendants were about as interested in Egyptian culture as William the Conqueror was in English culture. They learned the useful parts and put on the costumes, but didn't trouble themselves to learn the native language or absorb much of the culture. One aspect of pharaonic tradition the Ptolemies leapt into unprompted and with great enthusiasm was the custom of incestuous royal marriage, which is a little strange since it wasn't a Macedonian custom, but let's just say the family tree was very much a coiled knot of branches growing at the shallow end of the gene pool. If we do count the Ptolemies as a legitimate dynasty of Egypt, then we have to give them this. It was a long one. The longest, in fact, beating the runner-up 18th dynasty a thousand years prior by just over a decade. On the other hand, it's possible to argue quite seriously that the Ptolemaic Kingdom of Egypt was not a factual continuation of the same Egypt that had been brought together by the first dynasty, but rather an aesthetic revival, a useful costume that the dynasty wore to keep the priesthood and people of Egypt happy. In this view, Ptolemy was the first monarch of an altogether new country, wearing the guise of a continuation. To this day, some sources call it the 33rd dynasty, while others prefer to say the Hellenic, Ptolemaic, or Greco-Roman period. I think Egyptian culture and custom was so resilient that it's worth bearing with the Ptolemies. Ancient Egypt was over, and Egypt would never again be a superpower, but the Egypt that the Ptolemies ruled maintained far more than a simple veneer of Egyptianness. The Hellenic ruling elite might have worn the culture as a costume, as foreign colonisers will tend to do, but to the Egyptian people, their ancient customs were part of a national truth that included having a pharaoh. I want to talk more about the Ptolemies, and I will in another video at some point, but for now, let's move on to the last Ptolemaic ruler of Egypt. Or, more precisely, the last rulers. To cement stability, Ptolemaic monarchs are taken to ruling in pairs, not unheard of in Egypt's history, in precisely the circumstance that our next two candidates for last pharaoh rule under. Cleopatra VII, that Cleopatra, whom I'll just call Cleopatra from now on, was famously unseated in 30 BCE by the Roman who would go on to be the Emperor Augustus. She died reportedly to suicide and the reign of the Ptolemies died with her. This is the common version of events, but as with the endings of most things in history, the truth is a little more messy. Cleopatra's early reign was tumultuous, defined by a civil war with her brother and possible husband, Ptolemy XIII. I'm going to call him 13 because, well, his life was not a lucky one. When they came to the throne together, Cleopatra was around 18 and her brother was 10 or 11. As the senior sibling, Cleopatra assumed the role of senior monarch, but opportunistic advisers of 13 saw a chance to grab power for themselves. 
this came to a head with Cleopatra's expulsion from Alexandria. Her exile would not last long, and when Julius Caesar arrived in Alexandria, the young queen presented herself to him, knowing full well of Caesar's proclivity for unconstitutional coups. Caesar tried, with public reference to their father's will, to get Cleopatra and Thirteen to play nice, even installing their younger siblings as the rulers of Cyprus so there would be no dynastic rivalries in the future. What followed was not peace, but the siege of Alexandria. You see, the agreement, for all that it appeared to smooth things out between Cleopatra and Thirteen, in practical terms, it favoured the older sister. Thirteen's grasping advisers, however, realised that Thirteen's army outnumbered Caesar's by quite a margin and made their move. The siege of Alexandria was probably the worst time of Caesar's life, with the possible exception of its abrupt and treacherous ending. But he came out of it and defeated the army of Thirteen and his sister Arsinoe. Thirteen lived up to the name I've unkindly given him and fled the battle on a boat, wearing golden ceremonial armour. The boat capsized and Thirteen was found some days later, face down in the mud of the Nile. He was 15 years old. His sister and conspirator Arsinoe became a prisoner of Rome and though it would have been customary for her to have been killed, she was instead shown mercy and lived out her days as a priest of Artemis. Caesar and Cleopatra had not been idle during the miserable conditions of the siege and their affair was all but public. Cleopatra's firstborn, another Ptolemy, was by most accounts Caesar's son. Certainly Cleopatra put forth this story very prominently, proclaiming him throughout Egypt as such. He was a boy of the Ptolemaic bloodline, so naturally his name was Ptolemy, but a popular nickname for him at the time was the patronym Caesarion, sometimes pronounced Caesarion. I'll be calling him Caesarion from now on. After a bit of Roman pageantry, Cleopatra and her new brother husband Ptolemy XIV were the co-rulers of Egypt until 14's death probably by fratricide, at the tragically young age of 15 or so. Free of the burden of little brothers, Cleopatra declared her son Caesarion to be her co-monarch. He was three at the time, by the way. They never married, which was probably good for him as the consorts of Cleopatra never outlived her, but Caesarion would rule as pharaoh, at least de jure, for a little shy of 16 years, right alongside his mother. Cleopatra became embroiled in Roman politics, one final and ill-fated time, outliving her last consort Mark Antony by a few days. When she realised that Egypt would at last come fully under Rome's rule, and that she was destined to endure the public humiliation of being paraded in front of the Roman people as little more than a trophy, she opted to join her beloved Antony in the afterlife, and so fell the dynasty of Ptolemy. But wait. Those playing the home game will realise that only one of the two reigning pharaohs has died. Our boy Caesarion, Ptolemy XV, has outlived his mother, one of few men close to Cleopatra to manage this extraordinary feat. Let's talk about Cleopatra's last desperate plan to save her dynasty. The Battle of Actium in 31 BCE was not the actual end of Cleopatra's reign, but it established the inevitability of her end. Cleopatra began to turn the wheel of bureaucracy so that Caesarion, now 17 years old, could assume power as sole pharaoh. There was a way the Romans did things when it came to the treatment of treasonous Romans, which Mark Antony certainly was. The life of a Roman citizen, particularly of a wealthy aristocrat like Antony, was sacrosanct. By and large, the expectation that Mark Antony had was that he and Cleopatra would be allowed to go into exile. Octavian, the man who would become Augustus, did not do things the usual Roman way, however. Caesarion was sent south and east to the port of Berenike, very possibly as part of a larger escape plan that would have seen the young king eventually in India. He never made it, and was brought to Alexandria for execution. Perhaps his tutors and guards were deceived into thinking Alexandria was safe, or perhaps they simply betrayed him for a reward. Caesarion's execution was about more than his rulership of Egypt, though. He was also accepted to be a biological son of Julius Caesar, 
As an adopted son of Julius Caesar, Octavian could not allow Caesarion to live and forever be a threat to his inheritance. Either way, Caesarion died 10 days after his mother. Caesarion was recorded at the time as sole pharaoh to fill the gap between Cleopatra's death and Rome's complete takeover, with Octavian taking the pharaonic role. Was he ever really sole pharaoh? He was far away from the capital when his mother died, already effectively in exile. He never ruled Egypt alone in any practical sense. The strongest argument for Caesarion being the last pharaoh is that he was the last person to bear the title while Egypt was a sovereign nation. But that's not very strong. For one thing, Egypt was all but annexed by Rome after the Battle of Actium, with just a few legalities to tie up. So Caesarion became sole pharaoh more or less at the moment Egypt ceased being a sovereign nation. Before that, his mother's manoeuvring with Caesar had ensured Egypt's status as a client kingdom, so its sovereignty was questionable, even before Caesarion was crowned at age three. I think the most that can be said about Caesarion, in the end, is that he was the last person who once ruled as pharaoh of an independent Egypt, but with asterisks on the words last, ruled, independent, and Egypt. Not a great claim. I think Cleopatra is more credible here, by a long way. She did rule, both in title and in fact. She was the senior monarch even though she always ruled alongside someone else. And her death ended the reign of her dynasty, even though she was briefly outlived by her heir. Neither Cleopatra nor Caesarion, however, were the last people to bear the title of Pharaoh. Prepare to enter a bizarre world, ruled by curious gentleman historians, whose love of technicalities is surpassed only by their adoration for Cicero. After the formal annexation of Egypt into the Roman Empire, Rome transitioned from a republic, with power concentrated in the hands of a few, to an all-out monarchy. Egypt's place in the empire was on paper that of one more province, but in reality, the emperors adopted Egypt as their personal province, assigning governors to it independently of senatorial approval. In fact, no Roman senator could so much as visit Egypt without the personal permission of the emperor. Pharaoh was not among the titles the emperors accrued within Rome. Their official relationship with Egypt was just like their relationship with the rest of the empire. Imperator in Latin, autocrator in Greek. Even so, they were regarded as the de facto pharaohs to Egyptian officialdom and arguably to the Egyptian people. And ceremonially, they would be received as pharaoh on the rare occasions an emperor would visit. This suited everyone perfectly. The traditional Egyptian priesthood could satisfy themselves that there was a mortal intermediary between the gods and the people, and the emperors could be assured of the loyalty of the Egyptians, whose ancient hierarchies had not, at least in name, been overturned. Rome did things a little differently than most previous foreign conquerors. For one thing, the emperors did not reside in Egypt and left it entirely to its own devices. This would have an impact on Egypt's view of its new dynasty of pharaohs, because as a Roman province, Egypt was no longer at the centre of creation. There's an interesting bit of evidence for this shift of perspective. For the first couple of centuries, Roman emperors were accorded pharaonic names in the Egyptian language, cementing them to the office that had existed since Egypt's first unification thousands of years prior. By the end of the second century CE, this tradition had fallen away. And you see instead the Hellenized names of the emperors, spelled in hieroglyphs but phonetically. They were no longer being given true pharaonic names. In other words, they were viewed officially as foreigners ruling Egypt rather than pharaohs of foreign descent. A fine distinction, but a really interesting one. In time, the title of pharaoh became awkward for the emperors. Rome became increasingly Christianized, and the capital of the Egyptian province, Alexandria, was one of the epicenters of the spread of Christianity. A Roman who wanted to maintain his relationship with Christ could not very well accept the title Son of Ra, or claim to be an intermediary between the ancient deities of the Nile and the Egyptian people. For numerous reasons, including the fact that Latin never really caught on in Egypt, the province fell under the aegis of Constantinople. Within two generations, the only tolerated religion within the Eastern Roman Empire was Christianity. 
and never again would anyone bear the title Pharaoh, officially, religiously, or otherwise. Among the so-called Roman pharaohs, there are really only two candidates for the honour of being last pharaoh, and while the later emperor has the more obvious claim to that honour, there are reasons that maybe he doesn't count. Diocletian, who honestly gets nowhere near enough attention from Rome enthusiasts, divided the empire into four administrative areas, a western and eastern empire, and each empire to have a senior and junior emperor. This was called the Tetrarchy, and it probably created as many problems as it solved, but it was a shot at stability following a long period of civil war in an empire that was far too large to be governed the way Rome was used to governing. Eventually, the Tetrarchy would collapse to infighting, to nobody's surprise. Diocletian was, as far as we can be sure, the last Roman emperor to visit Egypt. When the empire was divided into four administrative districts, his went as far north as the Black Sea and as far south as the Upper Nile. Why is Diocletian a candidate for the title of last pharaoh if there were pagan emperors after him? The answer is simply that he visited. And on his visit he will have been received as pharaoh, not simply recorded as such, distantly in the annals of a place he never set foot in. You might think that's a little bit of a thin argument and you'd be right. Our final candidate is Maximinus Dyer, and the end of his life mirrors those of Pesamtek and Cleopatra. Born into a peasant family in modern-day Serbia, he was the junior emperor under Galerius, and directly governed the region that contains Syria and Egypt. He spent much of his time defending his borders from the Sassanids far away from Egypt. It's vanishingly unlikely that Maximinus Dyer ever went to Egypt to be received as pharaoh, but he was a committed pagan, and he was considered pharaoh by the Egyptians at the time. His rival and successor, Licinius, was probably a Christian, but in any case had no use for ancient pagan titles. Whether you think someone has to go to Egypt and be received as pharaoh to count or not, one thing is certain. When Maximinus died in 313 CE, likely to suicide, he took the title of Pharaoh with him. After almost three and a half thousand years, the great house closed its doors and would forever remain empty. To take you on a quick tour behind the scenes, I wrote to varying degrees of completion three conclusions for this video before realising that none of them felt true by the time I'd made much progress on them. Who was the last pharaoh? Well, let's start with who I definitely think it isn't. I don't think the Romans count as pharaohs. The so-called Roman pharaohs ruled Egypt as a province of a vast empire. Much like the Persians, Pharaoh was a bit of local colour applied to their true title of autocrator. It was a mask they sometimes deigned to wear, not a crown. Egypt, in the sense of a sovereign nation, did not exist to be ruled, and if your follow-up question is whether I think the Persian dynasties count, well, no, it looks like I don't. I'd already commented earlier in the video that I thought they might have counted as another intermediate period. I also don't think it's Ptolemy Caesarion. One of the conclusions I started writing picked him, but it stopped seeming true the more I thought about it. Let's say Cleopatra's plan worked. Caesarion escaped to India, gained foreign allies and an army, and retook Egypt, say, a decade later. In that alternate universe, maybe we'd say that Caesarion had two reigns, a shorter joint reign with his mother, and a later longer reign after a ten-year interregnum. If in an alternate universe, his earlier period as pharaoh counted, then it counts in our world too, because history went the same up to the point of Caesarion's escape. Right? But here's the thing, if that had all happened and we recorded Caesarion's joint reign with Cleopatra as the first of two, we would be constructing a version of events for the sake of neat categorization. The reality would be the same. He would not have ruled a sole or even senior monarch and that first period of kingship would have ended at the same moment as his mother's. Yes, as Caesarion fled, there might have been loyalists who called him king, but kingship is a matter of political reality as much as popular acclaim, to say nothing of divine right, and once Cleopatra died, he wasn't king in any real sense. 
He was arguably the last person living to have both ruled a sovereign Egypt and have been called Pharaoh, but he never ruled alone. He never held the title solely in his own right. So, Cleopatra then? She's the accepted answer. After her, Egypt came under Rome's rule, then Constantinople's, and then it was conquered a few centuries after that, gaining independence only after the culture of ancient Egypt had become a thing of legend, and the hieroglyphic script was no longer comprehensible to anyone living. Egypt had been conquered before by foreign powers, many of whom eventually went native, but there is a sense in which its second conquest by the Persians was the end of what we call ancient Egypt. From then on, it would either be a province of someone else's empire, or a vassal in all but name. If you want to set a strict definition of Egypt as a sovereign power, then the last true pharaoh would be Necht Nebo II, who came at the end of a 40-year dynasty that represented the last gasp of Egyptian native rule. In the end, there's no neat conclusion. I've whittled it down to two, and you might not agree with how strictly I've whittled. You might be at a dinner party and want to say, Did you know the last pharaoh was a Serbian peasant? And there would be some, looking at you, gentlemen historians, who might agree with you. I wouldn't, but I hope I'd be polite enough to let you deliver your factoid before we all tuck into some cheesecake. I hope I've shown that the question is more difficult and more interesting than it first seems, but that's the thing about interesting and difficult questions. Often the final answer isn't the point of asking them. The point is to ask them, to challenge our assumptions, to look generations of dead historians in the eye and tell them, history is ours now. First things first, huge, huge thanks to some wonderful friends whose talents I was lucky enough to be able to call upon making this video. The character design is by Praxis Descends and Lazy Honeybee. Lazy Honeybee also did my title card and background. My title theme and the background music for most of the episode is by Sassy Dragon. To you watching this, thank you so much for watching the first of what I hope will be a great number of videos. I aim to post a video every week. They won't all be of this length, but I want to try to deliver an essay length video like this once a month. My channel is shiny and new, and it would be a huge help if you would like the video and consider subscribing to the channel. That's the best way you can help my channel grow, as well as sharing my videos around and helping me find an audience before I'm crushed under the weight of the algorithm. I've also got a Patreon where you can support the channel and get involved, from voting on content to suggesting topics for future videos to just chatting with me on Discord. I'm going to be as active in the Patreon community as I can, since I assume anyone joining it will be Egyptology nerds, and I love Egyptology nerds. Why a Patreon so early in the channel's life? Well, these videos take a while to research, write and produce, and even though I enjoy making them, I'm a freelance writer by trade. So a financial justification for spending the time making these videos means I can make more of them and at a higher quality. Some folks have already signed up for Patreon, uh, even though the first video is only out now, and if any of you are watching, and I certainly hope you are, thank you so much. It's wonderful to know that even if I'm very new to this, and even if you're not as mad about Egyptology as I am, it's nice to know that I've got your support, and even more than the cash from Patreon, knowing that I have your moral support really, really means the world. And the same goes to anyone watching this uh, who is a patron. Whether it's right now or um, five years from now, it really does mean a lot. Thank you so much. Okay, Patreon pitch over. If you're still here listening to me, then life, health and prosperity to you. If you live in the future, park your flying car and consider looking at another one of my videos. But if you live in the now and there aren't any other of my videos, then thank you so much for watching and I'll see you next week.